From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. Good Friday morning. It's 6 o'clock. Welcome to Montana This Morning. I'm Victoria Hill. Thank you so much for kicking off your day and the weekend with us. And good morning to our friend Miller over in the Weather Center. Now, we all love a good Friday, but uh, today's weather might challenge us a little. Uh, just a little bit. We do have some slick roads out there, and we'll tell you more about the road conditions here in just a bit. Just uh, keep in mind, if you're watching, yeah, your, your travel this morning may be impacted, at least seeing some slick roads out there and could see some icing on the bridges and the overpasses this morning. Light snow falling on the rims right now as uh, we're at 29 at the airport feels like 21. Humidity at 92%. The dew points at 27. A lot of moisture out there, enough to where we could see some patchy fog in spots this morning as well to go along with those slick roads. Winds out of the north at about 8 miles an hour. Let's crunch some quick numbers. Yesterday, we got just above average 63 briefly before the cold front came in. Gust up to near uh, 40 miles an hour. Shouldn't have to worry about that today as those winds are tapering off. Uh, precipitation less than a tenth of an inch measurable. Uh, we're behind for the month and for the year. Three tenths of an inch of snowfall. So we're pacing just ahead of where we should be and we're still adding to that total somewhat this morning. As you can see, we have snow all around with temperatures in the 20s and 30s as we wake up. Highs today in the 30s and 40s as a ridge of high pressure, weak ridge to start. Uh, we'll start to clear things up today. Uh, the snow will go away. Maybe some breaks for some sunshine. But of course, we are going to stay well below average. Our high today in Billings up to 40. Starting off with the snow this morning with temperatures in the 20s and 30s. We'll be in the uh, 30s by lunchtime and then 40s later this afternoon. It's not a good day for it, <laughs> but it's picnic day. You know what? The bonus of you know, sticking to your guns and having a picnic today would be, there wouldn't be any bugs bothering you. That's true. So that's a, that's a way to a look on the positive way. side. Yeah, to ruin a good picnic <laughs> is all those bugs just bothering you and buzzing past your face. So. What kind of, what, I mean, when you go on a picnic, what kind of sandwiches do you like to do? Oh my gosh, uh, well, we do sandwiches and we do like the, the crackers and cheese mm -hmm. and summer sausage. And so we just kind of do a mix of everything, fruit and other must have when you go on the picnic. So sure. kind of eat, you know, the easier stuff. To yeah, do, keep but. it nice and simple. Well, hopefully yeah. spring will finally arrive soon enough that we can get out there and do some picnicking, huh? Yeah, we'll, we'll take it in, in spurts. When we can picnic, we'll picnic. Yeah, true. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Miller, thank you so much. I'll get on to the news. Okay. Topping our news this Friday, Governor Greg Gianforte is putting pen to paper on legislation for missing and murdered indigenous people. MTN's Jonathan and Barian reports on the latest steps the state is taking to address the crisis. On Thursday, Governor Greg Gianforte held a ceremony to mark the signing of a suite of bills aimed at showing Montana's continued commitment to continuing the dialogue about how to deal with what has been called an epidemic. The missing and murdered indigenous persons crisis has tragically impacted far too many families in Montana. And let me be clear, it must end. Gianforte signed Senate Bill 4 into law on Thursday. Earlier in the week, he signed House Bills 35 and 98. Among those in attendance Thursday were the family of Selena Not Afraid, a 16-year-old girl from Hardin whose body was found last year, several weeks after she went missing. Selena's aunt, Cheryl Horn, has become a prominent activist for missing women. We're here because of not just Selena, but Selena told me, don't stop because there's other girls standing behind me. SB4 from Senator Jason Small of Busby extended Montana's Missing and Murdered Indigenous Persons Task Force for another two years. What was one of the, the great aspects of the task force itself was it had, there were a lot of meetings. There was huge community buy-in um, and it kept, it kept the light on, you know, it kept people talking. Representative Sharon Stewart Paragoy of Crow Agency brought the other two bills. HB 98 also extended the Looping in Native Communities grants to set up a portal for reporting missing Indigenous people. HB 35 will set up a commission to confidentially review missing persons cases. It's important to, as Montanans to come together and to be able to ensure that there is our young women, our young men, our people are safe, on, our children are safe. One thing that everyone at Thursday's ceremony agreed on, these bills are only a first step, and there's still a lot of work to do, particularly at the community level. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. 
And maybe the most controversial bill of this year's session could be headed to the governor's desk today. Both the House and Senate endorsed HB 112 yesterday. That's the bill that bans transgender women and girls from competing in women's school sports. A final vote will be held in both the House and Senate today. The Senate endorsed a bill that would make it illegal for Montana businesses or the government to require vaccinations. The bill says businesses cannot make shots a condition of employment and the government cannot deny services to anyone based on their vaccination status. Opponents said the bill could put nursing home and assisted living facility residents in danger. But the Billings Republican who sponsored the bill said thousands of people have reached out to lawmakers saying they fear for their job if they don't get a vaccine. This is the foot in the door. The camel's nose under the tent, the foot in the door. This is the opportunity to, to not just have vaccine status on a passport, but your religious, your religious preference, your political identity, what you believe, what you think. This is just the beginning, and this is why this bill is so critical and important today. This is just the beginning of the invasion of our privacy and our fundamental constitutional rights. The bill would not apply to vaccination requirements at schools or daycare centers. Well, new this morning, Warden and Valentine residents remain under a boil water advisory, but help is on the way. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is pledging nearly $5 million to help rebuild critical water infrastructure in the community. About 300 customers have been without clean water for over a year as nitrates continue to leak into their supply. The funding will be used to construct new groundwater wells, a well house, and a water main crossing. Back here in Billings, Mayor Bill Cole is running for re-election. He made the announcement yesterday. The mayor says helping the city recover from the pandemic remains one of his top priorities. And with shootings and violent crime on the rise, he says work needs to be done to keep Billings residents safe. Well, we need to focus on public safety. Billings has a crime problem. Our crime rate has doubled the uh, last uh, 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 10 years. And we need additional resources, but we also need to use the resources that we've got uh, uh, even better than we are. And uh, working together, I think we can accomplish all those things. The election will be November 3rd. Several city council members are also eligible for re-election. The deadline to file is June 21st. In campus news, time is ticking for dozens of Montana State University employees to find new housing. The university told residents they have to move out to make room for graduate students. Yesterday, MSU students organized a walkout to voice their objections to the university's decision. Last October, 78 employees were told they had nine months to find a new place to live. With the cost of living so high in Bozeman, many of those staff members are worried they'll have nowhere to go. Look at like the human beings that are in the center of this and to realize that it does have a huge impact. Like these are people who are trying their hardest. They're working full time. They're looking for ways to support themselves and their family. Like, please don't make it harder. <laughs> There's enough things we have to deal with. But MSU officials are standing by the decision, even pointing to the amount of money these residents make to justify evicting them. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. We're doing this for the benefit of students. We have 198 graduate students who are waiting for housing. The protest today was very concerned about wages, but um, there are 40 employees in those units. The majority of them are faculty, and their average salary is $66,300. Current residents living in the housing have until June 30th to move out. Organizers of yesterday's walkout want MSU to provide housing for everyone. Officials say that would require raising tuition, which only the Montana Board of Regents can do and not the university. In pandemic news, CDC advisors are holding a six-hour meeting later today on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the blood clots that have been linked to the shot. Vaccine hesitancy is one obstacle toward achieving herd immunity, but health experts say Americans should worry more about getting COVID-19 than any side effects from the vaccines. CBS's Laura Podesta has more. A federal advisory committee may lift the pause on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine today. It comes more than a week after distribution was halted, following reports of rare but dangerous blood clots in fewer than a dozen people. Over 6 million doses 
you know, the number of these reported blood clots was still, you know, exceedingly rare. The FDA will likely now require a warning with the shot. I think too many people may be scared off by taking the vaccine. They shouldn't be, but perception is everything when it comes to vaccines. Officials are also investigating the death of an Oregon woman who developed a clot, though it's still unclear if it was related. It might be about a week or later before they're able to conclusively decide on the cause of death. Bringing the Johnson & Johnson vaccine back into circulation would mean an additional 10 million doses. But around the country, vaccine appointments are increasingly going unfilled. We are not seeing patients that have been vaccinated being admitted to the hospital. Younger people are making up the majority of COVID patients at Goshen Hospital in Indiana. Infections are going up, hospitalizations are going up, and both of those things are unnecessary. Abby Hall got COVID in December and is still dealing with health issues. If something health related pops up in my life, I'm always like, is this new or is this COVID related? Researchers at Yale University recently launched a study looking into whether the vaccine may actually help alleviate the lingering symptoms in some so-called COVID long haulers. Laura Podesta, CBS News. More than 135 million Americans, or 40% of the population, have received at least one shot. Scientists fear they may have found another dangerous new strain of COVID-19. It was discovered in Texas and appears to be more contagious and cause more severe illness. The strain was found in a saliva sample of a young student with cold-like symptoms. Researchers say the student tested positive March 5th and again on March 25th meaning it may cause longer infections. Early research shows it may be resistant to antibodies. The CDC is considering loosening some of their mask, mask recommendations. The agency said they may announce face coverings are no longer necessary outdoors. Researchers found less than 10% of transmission occurs outside and the odds of spreading the virus indoors were 19 times higher.